Would you go with me to 1 Corinthians this evening, please? 12th chapter, 1 Corinthians 12. And if you didn't bring a Bible, hold up your hand. We have extra Bibles. Be glad to let you use one of ours. Going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. For some weeks now, we've been on the subject of being hungry for the Holy Spirit. Somebody say that out loud. Hungry for the Holy Spirit. And we are responding to the Lord's instructions to us through the Word. He told us to do something. And we've been a-doing it and believing to do it even more. And here's what it is in the text, 1 Corinthians 12 and 31. He said, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. What did he tell us to do? Covet earnestly. What? Gifts. Gifts of what? Well, what he'd been talking about the whole chapter previous, the gifts of the Spirit. He specifically mentions nine gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom. Word of knowledge. Discerning of spirits. Special faith. Working of miracles. Gifts of healings. Divers kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. Do we desire those? Did he tell us to covet them earnestly? Yes, he did. Are most Christians doing that? No, they are not. In fact, sadly, we are the small minority that even talk about them. A whole lot of Christians, people that they're born again, they love God, they go to church, believe Him to go to heaven when they die, but they never hear about the gifts of the Spirit. They never hear about these things. And uh, some have heard a little bit about them, but what they heard was that it's been done away with, and tongues are not for us, prophecy is not for us. Others They only heard one sermon in 20 years, but the sermon was about that all these are natural things. Gifts of healings or doctors, diverse kinds of tongues or people that have linguistic ability and have learned multiple languages. And, you know, I don't know how to explain working the miracles, but they try to explain these as natural things. None of them are natural. All thank God for doctors, but doctors are not gifts of healings mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Thank God for the ability to learn multiple languages, but that has nothing to do with diverse kinds of tongues. Right? Well, I went to school and I've studied. I've got a lot of knowledge. I've got a lot of wisdom. That's got nothing to do with the word of wisdom or word of knowledge. These are all supernatural, supernatural manifestations of the Spirit of God. And they are not passed away. They are for us now today. Right? And they're wonderful. And we must not explain them away or ignore them. We need to find out what they are. Go to the first part of the chapter here, verse 1, and you see that's the very thing he said. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, he said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not, Have you ignorant? How many know this is not just a man talking? This is the Lord talking, right? Through a man, through this scripture, is that can we take this as the Lord speaking directly to us? Did He tell us we are to covet earnestly these things? Did He tell us I don't want you ignorant of these things? And isn't it uh, interesting that the very things that He said covet earnestly, most of the church cares nothing about? The very thing he said, I don't want you ignorant of these things. 
that that's the things that people are completely ignorant of, don't know anything about speaking in tongues, don't know anything about gifts of healings, not nothing at all about working of miracles. Well, not us. We are not content to be ignorant of these things. And if he told us to covet them earnestly, he knows what's important. He knows what's precious and valuable. And if he says this is what you ought to covet earnestly and long for, then he knows what he's talking about. And that's what we're going to covet. We're not going to covet each other's spouse. We're not going to covet each other's car or land or house or position in life. But we are going to covet, long for, desire intensely the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, in order to get stirred up about wanting something, you need to hear about it, don't you? You know, I've always enjoyed cars and and in the early part of my life too much, and I had to kind of get rid of everything for several years, and then the Lord let me have some things again later, but uh, I, uh, I've i been for, you know, qu- quite a while now without a sports car, and uh, hadn't thought much about it, just, you know, just I'm busy preaching and teaching, going about doing what I should be doing, and I don't know what a month or two ago, I come across one. And I hadn't even thought about it for a couple of years now, but I got to looking at that, and I thought, now that's nice. <laughs> I got to, to reading about that and thought, uh-huh, stirred me up. Long as I wasn't hearing about it, long as I wasn't seeing anything about it, I, the, the desire wasn't there for me. I wasn't even thinking about one. Well, how many know in order to desire the gifts of the Spirit, we don't know, need to go 20 years and never hear about it. Right. We need to hear about it. And we need to think about it, talk about it, look at it, and it'll stir you up, won't it? Are you stirred up at all about to give? I'm stirred up about it. And teaching and preaching on these and thinking about them and meditating upon I'm more stirred up than I remember being about these things. I'm after them. How about you? This church is after them. This ministry is after them. We refuse to live just a mental, physical life. We will live a spiritual life. We will have a spiritual ministry. We will have manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our services. We will have. Now, we have had some, and thank God we're not being unthankful, but how many know we've just touched the tip of the iceberg compared to what we can have? And so we're after the rest of it. Let's keep reading. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. In verse uh, uh, 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, or the margin says ministries, but the same Lord. And there there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, you know, manifestation is a word that has become popular in uh, so-called word of faith charismatic circles. And I think a lot of times people just overuse the word and don't even really know what they're talking about. But manifestation has to do with a revealing, a showing. There... God shows things. He uncovers things that were not seen and not known. Right? So when we're talking about a manifestation of the Spirit, we're talking about God showing out. Right? Showing showing off. Showing something. Right? That we hadn't seen that way. How many would just be thrilled for the Lord to do something and you go, mm, i never seen that. I had never seen that, but I want to see some more. And no, it's supernatural. And no, he did it, right? And when the Lord reveals something by a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a discerning of spirits, then he's showing us something he knows, something he sees the end from the beginning, something that he reveals that we didn't know. 
And when he is speaking through divers kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy, he's showing us something through that that we haven't heard, hadn't understood, hadn't known. And when he's manifesting himself through uh, special faith and working the miracles and, and gifts of healings, we are seeing things of his power that we had not seen and known. Manifestation, revealing, uncovering, showing. Instead of saying manifestations of the Holy Spirit, you could say showings of the Holy Spirit, uncoverings of the Holy Spirit. Say it out loud, Lord, Lord show, us show us some more. Lord, Lord uncover some things. <laughs> yes. Do we, do we desire it? We, we don't just desire it. We covet it earnestly. Now we've talked, uh, well, well let me read the rest of this. He said uh, the, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to who? Verse 7, who? Who could have one or more of these manifestations in their life? Who could? Every believer. See, he's writing to the church at Corinth and then to everybody that would hear and receive this. Every believer could expect one or more of these to be manifested in their life at different times. Everybody, every man. And he goes through the list. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another divers kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these works that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to who? Who? Every man severally or individually as he wills. Not, not as we will. As he wills. But he does will. Right? See, people say, well, we're just waiting, you know, if the Lord wills to do anything. And, and they wait for days and weeks and months and years and nothing happens. Well, we're just waiting on the will of the Lord. Oh, no. No. He's willing to do something all the time. It's just a problem of cooperation, a lack of faith. Now, uh, we've talked about the uh, revelation manifestations, and uh, we've talked about the utterance manifestations. These nine manifestations can be grouped in three categories, as we've already talked about, utterance, revelation, power. And he said, covet earnestly the greatest. Well, the... Uh, utterance manifestations, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. The greatest of those three is prophecy. The Scripture says so. Of the uh, revelation manifestations is uh, discerning of spirits, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Of those three, the greatest would be word of wisdom because that has to do with an uncovering, a making known of the plan of God and the future, and the purposes of God. Boy, that's pretty important, isn't it? And of the power manifestations, now we're into those and talking about them. We've talked about uh, gifts of healings already uh, last week. And uh, we are going to talk about tonight working of miracles. And then there is faith, or one translation says special faith. A better, tr a better phrase might be gift of faith. Because all of these are called gifts and manifestations. And then it's just the word faith. But we do need to distinguish it between uh, what the Bible calls common faith. Faith that we can all have and walk by and live by and from the word of God. This is something beyond that. It's, it's faith and in essence and nature is the same. But it's a gift of faith. And, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, I just stop right here. <laughs> Uh, it's so exciting, I want to talk about it. But, uh, you know, the Lord tears is coming. We'll get into that maybe another time. But somebody say, working of miracles. Work is that exciting? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Extremely, extremely exciting. 
Well, tonight I want us to get into it and talk about the working of miracles. Look back up in the, um, uh, what is that, the uh, tenth verse. He said, to another, the working of miracles. And other translations bring out plural, both in workings and miracles. Workings, plural, of miracles, plural. Now, uh, the Young's literal translation, and this is uh, sometimes people ask me about translations, which one do you like? Well, I, I like the King James. I've used it a whole bunch. Obviously, I'm used to it. I'm comfortable with it. I think it's a good translation. Uh, I also like Young's literal translation. It doesn't read, you know, just breezy necessarily, but I like accuracy. I don't like folk telling me what they think, and I'm supposed to be reading the Bible. I want to know what he said. Uh, Young's literal says, workings of mighty deeds. Somebody say workings of mighty deeds. The New American Standard says, the affecting of miracles. Oh, we got both of those tonight? Outstanding. Uh, somebody say effecting of miracles, workings of miracles, workings of mighty deeds, he said. Now this word workings is the very same word that back in verse 6 is translated operation in reference to what God does. So you could say operation of miracles and be exactly how they translated it here in verse 6. It's the same word. Operation of miracles. Does God know how to operate? Oh, yeah. Can he operate a lot of different ways? That's what the verse says, but the same God. A lot of different ways. One way completely different from the other, and yet same God. So operation of miracles Operation of mighty deeds. Now, the word for miracles literally means force or power. And we're not talking about authority now. We're talking about power. We're talking about power like the force of gravity power. We're talking about power like 2,000 horsepower dragster power. We, we talk, you know. That's just a speck in the bucket. But we're talking about power, right? Power, power. You know, massive power lifter, bodybuilder that can move huge weights. What, what, it, what does it take to move that weight off of that uh, bench or whatever? It takes power. It takes force. Does God have power? <laughs> Ain't nobody got power. Like the Father has power. All things are upheld, held up by the word of his power. What does that mean? Well, what you sitting on right now. I ain't talking about just the chair. I'm talking about what's under the chair, what's under the building, what's under the surface of the earth. I'm talking about what's under the crust, what's under the core. I'm talking about what's keeping the sun burning. And we know that's just one of many, 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 many stars. There's stars out there that swallow our sun many, many times over. And his, the power of the word he released when he said light be is still keeping them all burning tonight. We, we have no comprehension of the measure. Of his power. Somebody say power. 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 This manifestation is a showing forth of the effectings of some of his power. Would you like to see a showing forth of some of his power? Now, this is beyond intellectualism. We ain't talking about reason. We ain't talking about logic. We're talking about God showed up and did some. 
Is that what you imagined something? You thought something? You thought you felt something? No, power was manifested and something changed. <laughs> He's done it throughout the Bible. He's done it in New Testament, New Testament times as recorded in the book of Acts. And he still does it today. Said out loud, workings of miracles. He told us to desire these things. Covet them earnestly. Now let's go further into uh, the definition of this. The working of miracles. Uh, I like uh, Howard Carter's definition of this. And I believe the Lord gave him revelation many years ago concerning this and actually I'm even though you may not have known it uh, so most of the modern folks in word and faith circles if you've heard teach on this they were influenced by Howard Carter including brother Hagin he said so himself uh, he says the supernatural demonstration of the power of God that's what a work in the miracles is by which the laws of nature are altered, suspended, or controlled. It's a mighty gift, glorifying the God of all power, stimulating the faith of His people, and astonishing and confounding the unbelief of the wicked. I think I ought to read that again. What is the work in the miracles? These are the words of Brother Howard Carter. He said the working of miracles is the supernatural demonstration. Well, that's manifestation, demonstration, showing forth supernatural. Somebody say supernatural. supernatural. It's not natural. Supernatural demonstration of the power of God by which the laws of nature are altered, suspended, or controlled. Somebody said what goes up must come down. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> but God can do something that will change that. Right? <laughs> the normal laws that govern this earth and its atmosphere and everything else that he set in motion, how many understand since he set it in motion and he knows all about it, he could alter it. He could suspend it. He could control it. Did he make the sundial go backwards? Now, normally, well, normally, I don't know if that's ever happened <laughs> other than that kind of thing. You know, have you ever been out, you know, working outside and you saw the sun all the way down on this side and then you saw it just start moving back the other way? And hour after hour you thought, whoa. What is going on? How many understand that ain't just earth. That's earth. That's the moon. That's all the planets in our solar system. Now scientists would tell you that'd be impossible. If you tried to move this thing backwards, everything would run into each other and it'd disintegrate. Well, that's what you think when you don't know much. <laughs> but when you God and you made it, you know exactly how to just put it in reverse. And just back the whole thing up and then put it back in drive. <laughs> does he have power? Come on. Does, does he? Oh, God has power. Working the miracles is a demonstration of his power. And it, it can be, and it is, a suspending, an altering, a setting aside, an overriding of normal laws that govern everything on the planet. Now, uh, one of the outstanding examples of this is what happened, in fact, go back with me to the book of Exodus. What happened when God brought his people out of Egyptian bondage, he worked mighty signs and wonders and miracles, now didn't he? In Exodus, the uh, <clears throat> seventh chapter,
God has told uh, Moses that he has called him to send him to Pharaoh to require and demand of him that he let his people go. And uh, he's been talking to the Lord to the effect that uh, they won't listen to me. And he said, yeah, when you do this, and when they see this, they'll listen. Now, they didn't listen for time after time. And the scripture says the Lord allowed it. He allowed the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. He wanted to show himself strong over everything they worshiped and prayed to. They worshiped the sun. They worshiped the river. They worshiped all kind of things. And though it might not, we, we know about the so-called plagues and the things that happen, but what we don't realize is God was showing himself superior to everything they called God. Hmm? And he did. He showed himself mighty. And it was a showdown of, of sorts. Of course, it wasn't a contest. <laughs> but uh, in Exodus, the seventh chapter, Verse 8, the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, and he said, When Pharaoh shall speak to you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Now this says something about him and the whole society, doesn't it? They believed in miracles. Pharaoh, and we're going to see this in just a minute, had a whole court of magicians, sorcerers, and astrologers. So did most all kings. You see it in Daniel's time. Nebuchadnezzar had them. They had a whole court, and they weren't just for entertainment. Now, how many knows that if nothing ever happened from any magician or sorcerer, that die out pretty quick? But when the king is keeping a whole company of them and paying them and supporting them, and letting them have audience, something must be happening sometime. Are y'all with me? And so when, when Moses and Aaron come in, the Lord tells him, he's going to ask you to do a miracle. Show me something. He, he doesn't, doesn't just want to hear you talk. Show me something. You said God sent you here. Okay, show me a miracle. And he said, when he says that, here's what you're going to do. Exodus 7. He said, you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it down, throw it down before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent, a snake. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. And they did so as the Lord had commanded. This is Exodus 17. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a snake. Did that happen? Now, see, there are a lot of scholars that will tell us now, no, 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 that didn't happen. That's typical. That's figurative. But no, this is magic. You got a stick, you throw it on the ground, and it's a living, crawling snake. No, 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 we're educated people. <laughs> well, you're closed minded people and prideful, arrogant people to think that nothing can exist but what you've experienced. And you've only been alive. Less than a day. God time. Right? Been alive this long and know nothing. Yeah, but I went to school and got a degree. A degree in what? How many understand when the people teaching you don't know what they're talking about? When you graduate, you got a degree in ignorance and confusion. I got multiple degrees. In what? 
Who taught you? Now, there's some good education, don't get me wrong, but there are some people teaching in, in renowned universities that are absolutely stupid. I'm, you're talking about ignorant. They are total failures in, in their marriage. They're total failures at, as parents. They've tried to sh kill themselves four or five times. They're miserable, and they're teaching people's youth. They're failures in every other area. They're hiding out in the university. That's right. Now, that's not everybody. But I'm just saying, just because you passed a class doesn't mean you know something. Right. Just because you have a degree doesn't mean you know something. Right. Depends on where you went, what you heard. What was it? There are li How many understand, even in our elementary schools, there are lies taught as truth? There are theories, unproven theories, taught as fact to their little impressionable minds. Well, if the Bible says this happened, it either happened or the Bible's not so. Can't have it three or four ways. Either this is, is a work of fiction or this happened. You can't have it both ways. It happened. it happened. I said it happened. it happened. And this is a, a, a prime example of the working of miracles. Now, could God have just made a snake appear on the floor? He could, but that's not how he did it. How did he do it? He used a man, and he used a stick, and he used the man throwing the stick. So the man was involved in the working, and God did the miracle. Now that's the principle that you'll see in every one of these things. That there are Miracles can happen in different ways. But specifically talking, a working of miracles is when God would use a man or a woman and he uses something, their hand or a cloth or a stick or salt or uh, cornmeal or I'm quoting instances. Uh, you know, you use sticks several times. Sticks. Well, some people might call that a wand. Well, watch out, Brother Keith. Oh, I'm just getting started. <laughs> Why is it so popular for to talk about sticks and wands and sorceries because it has its basis in history and reality. Keep reading. Now, I'm not saying Aaron had a wand. In fact, I don't even believe that. He had a stick. I would, I would guess it's more like a walking stick, a staff. But the reason I bring it up is because look what happened next. Pharaoh, verse 11, called the wise men and the who? The who? Sorcerers and, and the magicians. Now, see, we think magicians are for party tricks. We think sorceries are just fairy tale. He had a bunch of them in his court, and they were not there for entertainment. What were they there for? To do magic and sorcery. And what did they do? Are y'all there or not? Can you take this or, or am I talking to the wrong thing? What did they do? They also did in like manner with their enchantments. What does that mean? They throwed down sticks or wands or whatever they had, and they also turned into snakes like Aaron had done. That's a miracle, isn't it? But it wasn't from the Lord. But what happened next? They cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. Did it really happen? We're not reading fairy tales. We're not reading fiction. We're reading the Bible. Did this really happen? Yeah. Is there a realm of the Spirit? Most people know hardly anything about it. Can power from that realm be manifested in this realm? Yes, it can. And not only from God. 
from the enemy at Candy. They threw down their, their rod and they became serpents. And so you got all these snakes crawling around on the floor there, marble floor, whatever it was, in Pharaoh's thro- a court. Really happened. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. <laughs> His rod snake, snake rod, gobbled up this one and 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 then just one and then he picked it up and it was a rod. Showed them off. And they're standing there scratching their head. Going, he got my rod. (laughs) Yeah, and you ain't getting it back. Your snake can't eat this snake, then you don't get the rod. You can't. God has shown himself superior over what the devil can do. Not even a contest. Now, that was not the end of this. Uh, In this same chapter, Well, actually, in verse 22, Moses and Aaron, they lifted up, verse 20, they lifted up their rod and smote the waters. Into verse 20, all the waters that were in the river turned into blood. There was blood, the fish died, the river stank. They couldn't drink the water. There was blood through all the land of Egypt. Verse 22, and the magicians of Egypt did what? did so with their enchantments. What'd they do? What do you need when there's blood everywhere? More blood. It's actually the last thing you need. But they made some more. With their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Why? Because he figured if his magicians could do the same thing, then I ain't ready to humble myself. My sorcerers did the same thing. They made blood too. Now in verse uh, chapter 8, verse 6, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And if you, verse uh, 3, Three, he had described it. He said there's going to be frogs in your house, in your bedroom, in your bed, and your servants. Going to be frogs in your oven, frogs in your mixing bowls, frogs everywhere. But see, they worshipped things like frogs and snakes and crocodiles. This is part of their religion. And God is showing himself. You know, you you love frogs? You want to worship frogs? Well, have you some frogs? <laughs> have frogs till you never want to see another frog. Maybe you'll wake up and realize there is only one true and living God who made frogs and everything else that's on the earth. See, they didn't worship God. They didn't acknowledge him. They acknowledged things like frogs. And so Aaron stretched out his hand, verse 6, and frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did what, verse 7? They did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Now that's just what you need. When you got frogs coming out of your ears, as they say, look what we can do. More frogs. Now here you learn a very important thing about the miraculous work of the devil. Can the devil do some miraculous things? Obviously. All he can do, though, is make it worse. He can't fix it. Now just think about it. What would have got them the most kudos with the Pharaoh? 
Come on, just think about what would have made them big man in Egypt. If you could get rid of the frogs with some hocus pocus, you would be the man. Don't you know they would have done it? If they could have. If you could have cleaned up and turned the, the blood back into water. In the river, don't you know that would have been the thing to do? But then why did they just make more blood? Because that's all they could do. That's all they could do. What is the, One of the devil's name is Apollyon, Abaddon the destroyer. He can't fix things. He can't save. There's no salvation in him. He can't heal. Don't care what you've heard. There's no healing in him. He can't fix things. He can give you more frogs, <laughs> more blood, more snakes. And on the next go around, lice came. And it said the, uh, the, the magicians tried to do it, and they couldn't do it. And for the rest of the whole ordeal, they were just on the sideline looking. And when it came to the last plagues, they themselves pled with Pharaoh, please. This, that, that, the magicians themselves said, this is God. Quit for we're all dead. Read, read and you'll see what I'm talking about. The very sorcerers and magicians themselves. Did not, now I'm not talking about just that day, but as thing after thing happened. And a, you know, after this, after the frogs, they're on the sideline. They couldn't do anything else or anything more. And then finally they pled with him. They, they said, this is God. Quit for we all die. When the boils came, the Bible said specifically, boils covered the magicians and the sorcerers so that they could not even stand up in the presence of Moses and Aaron because of their boils. Can the devil do some stuff? Yeah. Yeah. But what is it compared to God? Amen. Nothing. Now, it's become very popular. Movies, TV shows, books, articles, magazines, even studies in places of higher education about mediums, communicating, seeing the dead, sorcery. Is it innocent fun? It has its origin in reality. For millennia past, there have been mediums that sought and communicated with so-called the dead, actually familiar spirits and demons. And for, for millennia, there have been sorcerers that were really able to bring manifestations of the supernatural. We're not talking about smoke and mirrors. We're talking about something really happened. So is it okay for our children to want to be a sorcerer or a witch? It's not okay. It's not innocent fun. It's not empty fantasy. And though you haven't seen that much manifestation of it, the reason so much of it's going on is because the enemy's trying to get it restored. I said he's trying to get it restored. Oh, but the Holy Ghost is on the move. <laughs> and the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit restored. And greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Don't you ever be afraid, even a little bit for a moment, of anybody's incantation or spell or conjure or hoodoo or voodoo or you do. The fear of the thing is what could give it power in your life. Anybody ever talk about putting a spell on you, you know, working a, something on you, you laugh about it. I said, laugh, just laugh. So, <laughs> well, you better make it to fit you. Because it is written, the curse causeless shall not come. It will return to the place where it came from. So get ready for a boomerang. 
Yeah, make a big bad spell. And then you're going to wear it. Because you cannot curse whom God has blessed. It is written. And you're not dealing with some ignorant folk that don't know any better now. We know whom we have believed. We know the Spirit who is in us and on us. And He is the one that the demons are afraid of. <laughs> Do you get the picture? Aaron throwing down his rod, it became a snake. They threw down their sticks, whatever they had. They'd, and boy, they thinking they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him for a little bit. In just a few days, they're cowering over in the corner with their boils, can't even come out. It takes the, the most ignorant idiot to try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God on power, doesn't it? No, working of miracles has always been manifestations that God does, like Brother Carter said. Uh, it, it's a demonstration of his power. It can be confirmation of his call. Part of this was confirmation on Moses and Aaron's lives, that they were the ones God had chosen and sent, and for, for Pharaoh to listen to them. They're not just two bums out of the desert that had a wild idea, right? Power manifestations are confirming that he really did send them. Somebody say glory to God. Go with me to 2 Kings. Let's look at some more of this. 2 Kings. Just getting into your spirit? Could God manifest a work in the miracles? In, in among us, in your life, in our midst, well, we got to be open to it, right? We got to be at least know how it works and what's going on, and we need to be desiring these things. You see, working the miracles, uh, a lot manifested in uh, prophets of the Old Testament, like Elijah and like Elisha. Elijah had that showdown with Jezebel's prophets. You remember that? And there was a work in the Lord told him to do something. He said, all right, call them all together. We're going to see who's God. That's bold, ain't it? Because you know what's the penalty if you lose? You die. Then. <laughs> They're looking for him anyway to cut his head off. And uh, he said, Let's make the sacrifice and put the wood there and then take water. Now, they're in a drought. And they got water, barrels and barrels of water in the drought anyhow and poured it and soaked the sacrifice and soaked. Is he doing something? Is there a working here? And then he let their prophets pray and they were going, you know, I... How many understand, they must have seen some kind of signs of the devil's power at some point, or they wouldn't have all stood out there and prayed and cut themselves and tried to make something happen. If they'd have known there's no way nothing's going to happen, they wouldn't have tried. But they did all afternoon, screaming and hollering and cutting themselves. And where does cutting yourself come from? Hmm? To destroy. That's devilish practices cutting yourself this is the temple of the Holy Ghost we don't slice and cut the holy temple of the Holy Ghost right and they poured water all over this and, and they cried and cried and, and after uh, some time of this he starts mocking them he says I don't think he hears you you better cry louder so they did man they, they're in a frenzy they're just in a frenzy Screaming and bleeding and yelling and trying to get some, trying to get fire to come down, trying to get a miracle. And he said, "You know, your God maybe he's asleep. <laughs> That's it. He's taking a nap. <laughs> Hours pass. He said, "You know, maybe he's on a trip. Maybe your God's on vacation." <laughs> then when they're wore out. 
yelled out, screamed out, bled out. He comes up and he prays this simple prayer. And he said, Lord, I did what you told me to do. And fire came down. In the, this is not just a spiritual manifestation. Everybody saw it. Fire came right out of the sky and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, licked up the water. And the whole bunch, nose in the dirt, hit the dirt and said, the Lord, he is God. How many understand we way past intellectual debate and theories and logic and philosophy and I think, you think, nah, fire just fell and burned everything up. Now, of course, unbelievers today will try to explain that away. Well, there was maybe a freak lightning strike or, <laughs> or something. Ah, unbeliever. Unbeliever. Now, with these prophets, we'll talk about the other one that came after him, Elisha. Go to the uh, second chapter of Second uh, Kings. Second Kings 2. What are we talking about tonight? The workings of miracles. Do we desire it? Do we desire to see it in our day, in our generation, in the body of Christ, in the churches and ministries of the Lord? Do we desire it? Do we desire it a lot? Yes. Hungry for it? Yes. yes. Second Kings, the second chapter, the Lord took Elijah up by a whirlwind. That's pretty miraculous too, isn't it? And uh, down in the second chapter, the, the 12th verse, the uh, 13th verse rather, as Elijah was taken up, the mantle of Elijah fell down from him. And Elisha took up Elijah's mantle. Now, we're literally talking about, we might call it a cape or an overcoat that Elijah wore. Of course, he served it with Elijah for years now. You know, every, symbolic things all through this. You don't take your anointings for service with you when you go. You don't need them. Those anointings for service stay in the earth and they come on somebody else. People that are called of like uh, call and like faith that have been trained and prepared for it. Sometimes you hear people say, I'm claiming so-and-so's anointing. I'm claiming brother so-and-so's anointing. It don't come like that. It don't come like that. It's, uh, it, it's those that have been called to it and trained and prepared for it and been faithful in the preparation. But he took up that mantle, verse 13. And he went back by the bank of Jordan. In verse 14, he took that mantle of Elijah that fell from him. Had he seen that mantle for years? Had he seen the mantle on the man, and had he seen miracles in that ministry? Did he see? He'd seen some things, hadn't he? So this mantle represents a lot of history and a lot of power and a lot of miracles. And now the man's gone. And ain't nothing there but the overcoat. And yet the God of Elijah is still there. And uh, he took that mantle, and the Bible said uh, he smote the waters with the mantle, and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. Somebody say miraculous. miraculous. God's done this a number of times. Ain't he? The Red Sea, right? Split Jordan for the armies to go into the the promised land, and here it is. He takes, now how many understand God could have split that another way? He could have just split it. But he used Elisha taking the mantle and swinging it and hitting the water with the mantle. That was the working. That was the operation. And when the, when the mantle and the faith it contacted the water, there was a manifestation of power, and the water rolled back. It was not natural. It is not explainable with natural phenomena. 
It's supernatural. And it happened. Now, without taking you to every one of the others, there was another time when they were uh, uh, eating, all of them, and somebody had got a bunch of poisonous gourds and put it into the stew, and they didn't realize it until somebody called out and said, there's poison in the pot, there's death in the pot. And he said, bring me some meal. They brought him some meal, and he threw it in there. He said, now eat up. And they, everybody ate, and nobody had any damage or problem from the poison. Well, couldn't God have just, you know, neutralized that poison without him doing that? But that's what the Lord directed him to do, and it's when he took the meal and when he threw it in there, that was a working. It was an affecting. It was an operation. And when it hit the, 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 the stew, the power of God manifested, and a miracle happened. Come on, are y'all with me? Miracle happened. On another occasion, they were out uh, cutting trees. And a man was swinging an axe. You remember this one? And all at once, he swung that axe. Swang. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and when he swung it, it flung off. <laughs> and it hit the water. And how many knows what happens when a, a metal axe head hits the water? Kabloop. And the man said, oh, I borrowed that axe. I borrowed that axe. What am I going to do? And the man of God said, Where, where'd you lose it? Now, what does that matter? It matters. Where'd you lose it? He said, he said it went in right there. Maybe he thinks the prophet's about to go scuba diving. I don't know. He said it went in right there. And he took a stick. Remember that? Here's sticks again. And threw it in. And here comes the axe head like a bass. And came right up on the top. And it's just sitting there. And he had to tell the guy, well, go and pick it up. Because he's standing there going, <laughs> he said, pick it up, pick it up. And he reached down. How many understand an iron axe head does not float on the top of the water like a cork? What is this? It's a miracle. It's a manifestation of God. How many understand this is an altering of the natural laws? Isn't it? It's what Brother Carter was talking about. It's a suspending or altering are overriding of natural laws, power. Does God still do things like this? Oh, yes, he does. Yes, he does. But people have quit believing in it. People have quit talking about it. They're, people are scared to talk about it. Ooh, that's scary. Boy, I don't like to think about those things. Yes, you do. The wonderful, miraculous power of God can change and fix what nobody can fix. Right? In healing, here's a man who's a leper condemned to die, but he tells him, go down to the river and go in there and watch. Somebody say, well, this, this, but this is healing. Yeah, but it's a miracle. When he comes back, not just that the disease didn't get any worse after that, when he comes out, there's no sign of leprosy, and his skin is like a little baby's. That's a miracle. Well, couldn't God have done it, just him standing out in the prophet's driveway? But that's not how he, uh, he did it. He said, you go wash. How many understand the washing was a working? It wasn't just rinsing in the river that healed him, but that was the working that initiated the manifestation of power. How many remember Jesus did things like this? He took, he, he took a spit or water and dirt and made mud, didn't he? And put it in a man's eye. Well, couldn't God have healed the man's eyes without him touching him? Hmm? Could, he, could he have healed his eyes just by Jesus speaking to him? And that's what we're going to be talking about next. But that's not the way God always wants to do it. He has a diversity of operations, diversity of gifts. He took 
the, uh, the, the spit. He took the dirt. He took the mud. He put it into man's eyes. Why? This is a working, isn't it? I'm convinced there was something in the man's eyes that was not there. Well, our whole body's made out of dirt. How many believe God could make pupils out of dirt? Yeah. Optic nerves out of dirt. I mean, we're all made out of dirt anyhow. I mean, right? And he put that in his eyes with the spit, and he told him, now go wash that off. How many understand this is a working, and when he washed it off, there was a miracle. He was no longer blind. Does God still do things like this? Yes. Yes. Somebody say yes. Yes. God still does miracles. In the book of Acts, go over there real quickly. We need to look in Acts before we're through, don't we? Book of Acts, the fifth chapter. Glory to God. Glory to God. Acts chapter 5. Does it make you want to see them? Does it make you want to be involved in them? Yes, as it should. We're not going to leave here and go, well, wasn't that wonderful? All those great things happened back there then. Wouldn't it have been amazing to have been back there and seen it? Well, we do rejoice in it, but we rejoice that God's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And he told us to covet these things, and he wouldn't have told us to covet them and him not planning on manifesting them. Why would he tell us covet these wonderful and amazing things just to torment us by not having them year after year? He would not. If they were passed away and we shouldn't be thinking about them or looking at them, he'd have told us. And he wouldn't have put them in the book for us to read all the time. He'd have put something else. He hasn't changed. Men have changed. He hasn't changed. Acts 5, are you there? Said out loud, workings of miracles. Acts 5 and verse 12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Two or three? Two or three? Now, are we a part of the same church they are? Is our life supposed to read like this book right here, like this book of Acts? Then we should be hearing about many signs and wonders through the different and varied ministry gifts throughout the body. Right? We should be hearing about these things. And it said they were wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Verse 14, believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Let me just stop right there. You reckon there's any connection? Huh? Between the miracles and the signs and the wonders and multitudes being added to the church. Hmm? You have some of the things we've been talking about, just one of the kind of things we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes manifest at the church house. Who do you think is going to come next Sunday? That will go all over the community. That will go all over the state, the country, right? Now, some things God does, and it's miraculous, it's spectacular, but he doesn't want it broadcast. I remember, remember there were times he told people, don't tell this, didn't he? But then there were other times he'd tell them, go tell it. He has different purposes in his signs and wonders. But we know that he wants some things to happen and be known publicly so the masses will come. Even if they just come out of curiosity, they come to see, is it really so? And when they do, they see reality of God and come to know his goodness and love. And multitudes, somebody say multitudes multitudes born again added to the Lord added to the church of the Lord Jesus say it out loud so be it, so be it. in our day he said they were added to the Lord verse 15 in as much so this is a connection with what we just got through reading in verse 12 uh, 11 12 and 13 
chapter 14, inasmuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And there came a multitude out of the cities round about to Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed every, every one. How many? Well, verse 14, multitudes he's talking about. And verse 16, multitude. Somebody say multitude. That's a lot of people. How many of them got healed? And a bunch of them were getting healed through things like this. Peter walks by and his shadow comes across them while he passes and they get up off of their mat. He just walks by and the shadow. Now imagine, some of you in the front can see there's, there's my shadow right there. You see that? And I just move over here a little bit and now it's on these people. And that's all he did and blind eyes open and deaf ears open and lame people could walk and dumb people could talk and cancer ridden people were clean and healed. Do you believe it happened just like that? Somebody said, that's crazy. You expect me to believe a man's shadow came across somebody and they were healed from a terminal disease? It's up to you whether you believe it or not, but it's right here and I believe it. What is it? It's a work in the miracles. Why? Could God have healed them without Peter's shadow? Certainly. Well, why did he do it that way? Well, you know he's the head of the church, and he don't have to ask me or you <laughs> if he wants to do something different, right? But it is a work in the miracles because he used the, the working of his shadow coming across their person, and that's when the, the miracle didn't happen until the shadow came across. So it was a working of miracles. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say glory to God. Say it again. Glory to God. One of the most uh, perfect illustrations of this is when Jesus uh, was involved in the working of miracles of the feeding of the multitudes. Because you see the working and you see the miracles. Here they are, they've been out there, in, in out, outdoors, outside, hearing the Word of God for, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and days they've been out there. And he tells them, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? And then he said, you know, eight months wages worth of food wouldn't feed this bunch. And then one said, there is a little boy that's got a lunch here. Just five little loaves and two fish. But what is that among a crowd of thousands like this? It wouldn't make a din like that. And he smiled and said, bring it to me. That's just what we need right there. I read after one fellow trying to explain this. He said, yeah, now you know the loaves were bigger in those days. <laughs> You got to be kidding me. What kind of loaves was this little boy bringing for his lunch that's going to feed 10,000 people? <laughs> Ridiculous. Either a miracle happened or this is a fabrication. It's not a fabrication, it happened. This is a true account of what happened, and it was a manifestation, like Brother Carter said, a demonstration of the power of God that altered the laws of nature, right? And it stimulated the faith of God's people, and it astounded and caused to wonder the unbelievers. So he took that little, little, little boy's lunch, 
How much know what we're talking about? We're talking about Scooby-Doo lunchbox, <laughs> right? <laughs> With some crackers and some sardines. And not much. He's a little boy. He ain't planning on staying gone forever. It's just a snack, a lunch. Jesus holds these up, and he thanks the Father for them and blesses them. Is there power in the blessing? And then he broke them. Now, what's happening when he breaks? He breaks them. Is he working something here? And the working continued through the whole crowd, didn't it? Because he broke it and gave to his disciples. And to, after he had told them to sit down in companies of 50, then he told the disciples to distribute to the, uh, the company. And so, how many understand, a little boy's lunch, how would that go last long enough to go through the 12 men? Right. Something miraculous is happening from the time it comes off his hands to them. And he, there's a, it's already multiplied for them to have handfuls. And then they go, and how many understand that every time they broke it off and gave it, and then they broke it off and gave it to the next person, this is a working and a miracle. Oh, can you see this? And it is just undeniable and indisputable because thousands of people ate to satiation and were full and going, Mmm, that was good. You want some more? I got some. No, I'm full. I'm full. And then they had 12 baskets left over from a little boy's Scooby-Doo lunchbox. whatever count he had. Thank God. He is a God of power. Thank God. He does not weaken. He does not fail. Everything is being upheld by the word of his power. And thank God he still does signs and wonders to stimulate the faith of his people, me and you, and to confound and astonish the unbelievers. They try to explain it away, but they can't. They jump through hoops and pull this out and pull this out and write big books, but it don't make sense. And all the people that were there said, hey, I was there, I saw it. It wasn't there, and then it was. How can you explain it? Can't explain it. We don't know enough to now. If we knew, if we saw it from God's perspective, we could explain it. He could explain it. He knows exactly what happened. But we don't have to explain it. We can just believe it. I said we can just believe it and trust Him and covet some more. Stand on your feet. Everybody say, I'm hungry for the Holy Spirit. Say it again. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for the Holy Spirit. I'm hungry for the gifts of the Spirit. I'm hungry for working of miracles. I'm hungry. Come on, close your eyes and, and pray in the Spirit for a bit. Stir yourself up. Of nemangle adeshe, ef dimando oxore donishe, oh filemble ande gono. Of le baro di vinige, ef di balagozo, nem plende a do, nem plende a do, emble masure, kerende, iliste, ogondo, manane, apage, o doche. O vilemble, imano, on pati, e goman. And a be in the bow, a TV, a lobo, a Mary, embarrassale. Oh, we worship you. We worship our God. We thank you for your power and your goodness, your awesomeness, Lord. Oh, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you.
worship you, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah. Now, I plan to get into some other things in time to come. The Lord directs and wills that we only are able to touch on tonight. But the promise of the enemy, the devil, to people who are susceptible to these things is that you can have power. You can have miraculous power. If you'll do these spells, if you'll read these books, if you'll make these sacrifices, if you'll do these terrible things, you'll have power. It is all a lie. It's a lie. Somebody says, yeah, but I, 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 you read about the power that was manifested. Yeah, but it was not just power they had that they could use at their will. They simply yielded themselves, and the enemy was able to do something. When you're talking about the working of miracles and the gifts of healings and, and these things, none of these are gifts that we possess and we can use at our whim and at our will. And the person who said they could lied. You said, that's bold, Brother Keith. I know what I'm talking about. If anybody in the world could work miracles at will and whim, it would have been Jesus. And he out of his own mouth said he could not and said he did not. And we're going to be talking about how he did what he did later on and emphasizing it. But you can sum it up in one short phrase. One of the first miracles Jesus ever worked and did was at the wedding feast, you remember, of Cana. And you remember what happened? They told him they, he, they're out of wine. He said, well, you know, well, what's that to us? And, and I understand he didn't just say, well, stand back, I'll fix it for you. He said, what's that to us? And his mom just said to him, well, to the, the people beside him, said, uh, well, whatever he says to you, do it. Oh, come on, did you hear that right there? That is the key to miracles. Not just whatever you decide to do, you're going to exhibit some power. Never going to happen. That's a fairy tale. That's a delusion fostered by the rebellious devil. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted power like God had. He tried to usurp and get it. He did not succeed. And now he is so much less than he used to be. Did you hear me? He is a strip brought to naught, created being an angel, and he's about to be less than nothing. Cast in the lake of fire. His delusion of having power like God is getting further away by the millisecond. But how can we have miracles in our life? How could we see a working of miracles in our midst? Whatever he says to you, do it. And so he said to them, fill up the water pots with what? Didn't make sense, but they did it. When he says, throw the stick in there, don't make sense, but just do it. Right? But what's, what's, what's a handful of meal going to do? What's mud in the eye going to do? What's dipping in the river going to do? See, if you get too analytical, you're going to miss it. But you just have to do what he says, and when he tells you to do something, and you do what he says, expecting and believing, that's when the miracles happen. Lift up your hands if you will. Say it out loud, whatever you say, Lord. It's not as I will. It's as you will. I yield myself to you. I follow you. Help me to see what you want to show me, to hear what you want to say to me, to do what you would direct me to do, I yield myself to you.